we're going to be having Eric from Secure Ideas, and he's going to be talking about a tool called Cookie Monster, and also about it, exfiltrating data. Yep. So here's Eric. Uh, well, thank you everybody for uh, coming to my presentation after the keynote. When I submitted, I didn't realize I was going to be this early. So you know, kind of rough a little bit. You got to be ready early in the morning. But on the other hand, I get to become and, and listen as a uh, listen to all the other presentations later. Uh, but as TJ said, uh, here to talk about Cookie Monster and a little bit about exfiltrating data. Um, we came up with a tool that we dubbed Cookie Monster to help us during a pen test. A little bit about myself. My name is Eric Keen. I'm a senior security consultant for Secure Ideas. Uh, been with Secure Ideas for about two years. Uh, but in IT for about 20 now. Really focused on systems architecture, Windows mainly. Um, before I was with Secure Ideas, I was responsible for two very large Active Directory infrastructures. Uh, one at a small financial institution called Bank of America, and the other for the happiest place on earth, Walt Disney World. Uh, so a lot of variety of places that I've worked. Uh, for hobbies, I like to say I'm a movie enthusiast, a gamer, uh, and I'm a father of four. And honestly, at this point, with my kids, with the age as they are, I really don't have any hobbies except taking my kids to their hobbies. But at some point, I hope to actually be able to go to the movies again. A Little bit about Secure Ideas, because they paid for me to, to be able to come here. Uh, we are a security consulting firm. We do pen tests, architecture reviews, general security uh, consult, uh, consult, consultations, et cetera. Uh, one of the things that we like doing actually most more than the pen tests is actually uh, education and training, something we believe in um, significantly. So data exfiltration, very important part of, of protecting data, right? But honestly, it's probably something most pen tests never go through, right? And maybe it's because of the pen testers. They're so interested in getting shells, right? Hey, let's get as far as we can into this network and, and own everything here and be happy. But really, a pen test is about a client's data, right? That's what they care about. And what we're actually trying to, to do is we want to see if we can navigate through this network, get to what is most important to our client, and show them what faults they have. And really, data exfiltration is that last part. Admit it if, if this was a real job, right, where we weren't being pen testers, we were actually people hacking, trying to get into the network. You probably have a path out already, because you had to work your way in somehow. But as a pen test, a lot of cases what happens is you go in, you bring your laptop or whatever you might be using, you put it on the network and you act as a compromised device, right? You're, you're pretending that you found a method in and now you're trying to get to the data. Companies have spent lots of money and lots of resources, at least a lot of companies have, trying to prevent people from being able to get data out. Now, maybe it's something that we should start considering. Now, all clients aren't ready to have their data, right, attempt to have their data exfiltrated. They're not mature enough. They don't have the tools, right? Maybe we can help them find them. But there are lots of companies who do have these mature processes, right? They've invested millions, if not more, in things like DLP software, right, proxying, whatever it might be, to try and keep their data on the inside and not let it get out to the outside. And, you know, some companies don't want you to exfiltrate their data. We have clients who, you know, regardless of what you say, they won't let us use our devices, right? Everything has to be done on their network, on their devices, including writing the report, which, as I can attest, is a little bit more painful than writing it at home, right? You have to get back and you have to do the work there. But these clients might be the ones who actually need this type of test, right? This final level of validation that they have things protecting their data, right? Maybe not from someone who worked their way in from the outside, right, which we're trying to prove, but maybe somebody who's acting maliciously from the inside. So data exfiltration, what is it? Number one, lots of methods to do it, right? Honestly, there's probably more methods to exfiltrate data than to get into a network, right? Lots of options, and it starts with just general network protocols. File sharing, right, SSH, SCP, uh, secure copy, FTP, RDP. Honestly, if you're, the, the group you're dealing with have any of those four open from your device directly to the internet, there's really no point in even saying, hey, let's try and exfiltrate your data. You can, right? If I can get to a file share outside of your network from inside the network, you have serious problems, right? You're not ready. You need to start locking those down. You can send data out through, you know, web traffic, HTTP, HTTPS. Once again, if your client isn't proxying their traffic, 
there's no point in saying, hey, let's see if we can exfiltrate some data for you, right? You're going to be able to. You can send it anywhere you want. They're not going to know. There's no way of tracking it, no way of detecting it. Then you can get into other things like mail, right? Once again, hey, let's just send an attachment. Pretty easy to do, uh, but at this point, lots of co uh, companies are starting to block the ability to send attachments, right? You just can't send it out. And probably don't have open mail relays for you to just send email. Then you get into some harder protocols like DNS, right? Yes, it's possible to exfiltrate data through DNS calls. This is hard to detect for a lot of companies. Uh, there are some products out there and some, some companies who have done it. But from the inside, if you allow your clients, your devices, to connect to a DNS server on the internet directly, right, and not go through some internal DNS system, you're never going to see it happen anyways, right? Once again, you're not prepared, and you probably can lose data very easily. And these are just some protocols, right? There's even more. There's, there's records of people using NTP, network time, to exfiltrate data, right? Using certificates to exfiltrate data. The list goes on and on and on and on. I mean, so how to protect against all this is, is mind-boggling. Once again, probably harder than protecting yourself from getting hacked in the first place. And companies aren't getting, it's not getting any easier now, right? More and more people are moving to cloud services where you get things like SharePoint Online and, and you know, uh, Google Drive where it's so easy to right click and say share this document. And you say, hey, yeah, anybody with this link can access it. Well, now anybody with this link can access this data, right? Once again, easy method for someone not thinking nicely to get data on the outside. Luckily, this can be locked down, right? Not everybody has to be able to share data. Then we talk about physical methods of exfiltrating data, right? USB drives, laptops, right? Papers themselves, right? All these are viable methods of getting data out. All of them have protections, right? Uh, I like to think about that huge stack of papers, maybe, you know, the amount of data we're actually trying to get. And maybe sometimes you actually want to try and print something, but you can't get to the printer. But hey, this could work, right? I'm sure even with our clients that aren't the most aware of their physical security, I'm pretty sure somebody would notice if I brought a monitor and put it on a copier to try and get some data out. At least I'd hope they would. And then you get into some really interesting methods, right? Hey, I've separated my network. All my important data is on a separate network. You can't get to it, but you can see it, right? You know, everybody knows about the Bluetooth attacks, right? That's old news. You know, but that's one way that you can jump across networks, right? If Bluetooth is enabled on another network, you can just move across and start accessing it there. But the really interesting ones are the other two up here. Uh, probably my favorite is the, the hard drive. There's a documented record of people exfiltrating data by having the hard drive indicator light on a device flicker, right, and telling them what the data was. I think a, a drive light can flicker up to like 60,000 times a second or something, and they use that because they could see the light. That's how they got data off the network. Other people have used fan speeds and fan harmonics, right? You want to talk about really high-tech stuff, really interesting things to do, all methods that you can start losing data from your network. So how do you control this? How do you prevent it? Well, number one, I said it, right? If you allow everything out to the internet, you're, you've lost, right? Sure, you might be blocking people from coming in, but once they get in, you've lost your data. If you're using firewalls to block ports, you can start using the next-gen firewalls, right? That deep packet inspection that lets you see actually what's happening, what they're trying to do as they send data out through there. Interception proxies. Don't, have, don't allow people to go straight to the internet with web browsing, right? Proxy all the traffic. Look at it. Be sure you're breaking apart any encryption in the SSL, TLS, et cetera. DLP software, right? Don't let people mount USB drives, you know, for multiple reasons, but don't let them copy it or only approve devices, right? Whatever it might be, don't let people just pass data around. Drive encryption. Hopefully everybody at this point is, uh, you know, using BitLocker or something on their Windows devices. You know, laptops disappear all the time, right? If you're not encrypting the drive, the data is lost. Uh, and then, you know, sure, locking down printers and copiers. This is actually interesting, you know, Printers themselves, right, are, are security risks in general. Multifunction printers, they have hard drives, they store data, wonderful things for hackers to get to. But just the effect of printing, if you're really worried about your data and where it's going, there are methods that you can have people have to log into the printer or scan an ID or whatever it is before they can even use it. It's actually a good method to make sure people like us, pen testers, don't come in and 
use your printers as a method to find a way to bypass any NAT controls or anything else, right? If we can't see what the printer MAC address is, we uh, may not be able to move on. So, quick brief intro to data exfiltration, right? Something that we probably should start testing. There are lots of other methods, those were just a handful. So, why did we come up with Cookie Monster? We actually had a client who has spent a lot of money, right, on making sure their data stays in their network. They brought us in, they had us do a pen test, and then when we got to a certain amount of data, they said, okay, we want you to actually try and get that data out. We want to see if you can do it. They replaced the data, right, because we don't want to send important critical data to them, you know, from them out to the internet, but they said, here's something representative. See if you can get this out and see what happens. This client had very limited number of ports. We only had web traffic. That's all we could do. There was nothing else open out to the internet. But they were intercepting it. They read everything, right? They knew everything that was happening, everything going through that proxy. And they had a very responsive blue team. We did multiple phishing campaigns to them in the beginning to see what we might be able to hook into. And if there was anything that looked odd, they would have it within about five to 10 minutes, quarantined it. They would start blocking the URL that it came from and then any other URL we had associated with our company, right? They were very fast. They were very good. And they did lots of URL and content filtering, right? We couldn't get to any website existing out there. We had to try and track one down. So with all of this, we had to find some way of getting data out. We didn't want to try the physical route. We definitely didn't have time to try and figure out how to get a, an LED blinker to you know, move that fast. So we said, let's stick to the one thing we do have, which is that web traffic. Now, when people historically have tried to exfiltrate data vo via web, what happens is you, you find a website you can go to and you start posting it, right? You send the data, you send the file up through HTTP as a post. This means that people have a very long web connection, right? Your session is very long, you're sending lots of data, you're probably not getting that many responses back from the web server. We didn't want to fall into that pattern. So we said, what can we do? What can we do with this? Well, number one, we don't want to just try and send a file. Right? That requires post, it takes a lot of effort, and it's gonna be very large. So let's take it and break it down into chunks, okay? So we said, let's take the file, we're gonna encode it, just base64, no problem, encode that data, find a way that we can break it into small manageable chunks, and let's send it in cookies, right? Instead of just as raw data. Send it in the cookie itself. Cookies go everywhere, right? That's how web browsers you know, communicate with the servers. They know who you are. It's a great method. It's always encrypted, well, at least almost always this time, right? Can look like anything. And it may not actually be looked at by some of the proxies and everything. It might just be ignored because it's expected to be there. And then we have something on the back end that can pull all this data back together and give us our file. That was our plan. That's what we did. So we threw up a server out there. Uh, Mike from the company threw it up there. He loves JavaScript, so Node.js, bang, no problem. Threw it up there, threw up a web server, did some proxying, we chose Apache, because hey, it's there. And then we added a cert, right? If you want to use this tool, I highly recommend putting a cert on it, just because we, even though the client might be able to intercept that data and read what it is, we want to be sure that anybody else out on the web can't see it, right? So encrypt the data itself, make sure it's passing securely from us to the server. And then we came up with a feeder at the client side. Uh, you know, we use PowerShell, right? Because it's available. Sure, I know more and more people are moving away from PowerShell as a method to, to do stuff because Microsoft has introduced logging and more controls and all sorts of wonderful things. But it's still on every system. And you can use it to do almost anything. And we made sure that we made this look like a fairly normal command, right? We didn't call .NET libraries, we decided to just use commandlets, that way we didn't have to worry about if they did language mode or anything else. Uh, you know, and we made sure that we introduced things like, hey, make sure you look like a web browser when you're sending to the data, so it doesn't say, you know, PowerShell sent this. Made sure we used the right user agent. Um, we made it that it, it, you know, had a sleep function, uh, it didn't just send lots of requests really fast, it decided to slow down, take its time. So two parts, the feeder that actually breaks this data apart, sends it on forward through web requests, and then the server, Cookie Monster itself, that puts it back together. So quick little demo, hopefully. I find demos are like animals in shows. 
They work perfectly at practice, and then when you actually try and do it, it doesn't. I have a bad, bad time with them, but we're going to do our best here. So, I have a little, can everybody see that or is it too small? It's not, there's not much to see, but it's a little Linux server I have running locally. Uh, it's sitting there, I have Cookie Monster listening. And so, let's say I found this awesome file of credit cards. There it is. It says, hi Charleston down there, you can't see it, but I'll put something else here. All right, so I found this great file. Admitted, I'd expect something else to be much larger, but we're doing a quick demo here. So we have it. We call the feeder. I should probably import it. And I'll show what it looks like in a minute. Okay. Like any good PowerShell, you need to have that verb down. Uh, Make sure you have the right IP address. And I'm going to proxy this as well, just so we can actually see what it looks like. Oh, and yet, you should probably choose a file. And so there you go. He's just sending the data. Now, I admit, right, we're using PowerShell, so this is being logged if they've upgraded to PowerShell 3, 5, whatever it might be. But from what we've seen, typically, even though companies might be logging this data, they're not actually alerting on it, especially from clients, right, from desktops and laptops. It's there for auditing purposes. So yes, we have left a trace, unfortunately. But it didn't require any special privileges to do this, right? I just said send data, and it's doing it. And, all right, it finished. So I'll just close this down. And just to show you what happened, Yes, I can't do anything with Linux because I'm a Windows guy. So it just took all this, once again, it just took all the files, and then when it saw the last one, it put it together. I'll copy it down in a minute. I'm just going to pull it down as a text file. Hopefully I got that right. Let's see. Oh, I sent cookie feeder, didn't I? Ha ha, that explains why it didn't come out right. Let's send the right thing. Because sending the script itself is boring. Like I said, if it will go wrong, it will for me. Hey, so as we go through, let's actually look at this through burp, right? Since I proxied it to show you how it's breaking it apart. That's probably very small. So, as I said, it took it and it broke it apart. So it, it, it entered some data as cookies. The F, it's a file name. We added these two little uh, uh, forward marks on the front of it so that it's not necessarily interpretable as text, right? 
because this is just the file name encoded. So if I took it and I put it in the decoder, you'd see the file name. Automated processes hopefully will take the entire cookie if they're looking at it, right, not just the encoding. And so that obfuscates it. Then we have an integer that says, hey, this is part three of 16, and then this is the data, right? Just a chunk of data. What's the cookie name for that? The cookie name? Yeah. Uh, session. Yeah, session. We use session to try and hide what it might be doing. So, all right, now I have the right stuff in theory. Hey, hey, look at that. Uh, and then all we have to do is decode. And we have our file back, right? So there you go. Once again, we just took it, we base encoded it so it's just pure text, sent it out through an internet, picked it back up. So, you know, clearly this is not necessarily the best tool out there, we understand that, but it was something that we came up with in a couple of days to try and get the data. It has some pros and some cons. The good parts, it's using a high-use protocol. There's web traffic everywhere. It's seen all the time. It's happening through your company, right? Everybody is going out to the internet for stuff. It's using a get method, right? We don't have to post data. We're just saying go somewhere, and it looks like we're looking at a web page. And once again, cookies are typically encoded or encrypted in the first place, right? Why even worry about breaking them apart? Now, there are some cons, right? As of right now, because this is really in beta, uh, I guess is the best way. If somebody actually browsed the web page, they get an error. So if somebody decided to go look at this, they'd know something was up, right? But we weren't trying to fool people. We were just trying to fool the proxy. Uh, it requires a whole bunch of web requests to get that data out. Now, luckily, you don't have to do this all at once, right? You can do it in chunks. You can do it over periods of time. You don't need to just send it immediately, so that's not a problem. You're limited to the size, right? There, there's a requirement that said that every web browser needs to be able to accept up to 4096 bits for a cookie. Uh, 4093 is the lowest. So you want to make sure that if you're sending data this way, it's smaller than uh, 4,000 bits or bytes. And this can actually make some files even bigger. So how do you go about detecting it? Well, that's an interesting question. We sat down. We wanted to see if we could come up with it. You see a lot of web requests. Right now, there is no real web response other than OK, so that's not the great. Uh, and you can do, you'd have to do a lot of content filtering, right, or, or whitelisting, really block every website that you don't want to go to. Unfortunately, that's not perfect, right? We found a website that we could use, even though they were doing extensive URL filtering. There's that expireddomains.net. They're changing all the time, right? Find one. And then all of the companies that provide you with URL filtering have web pages you can go to to see how they are categorizing it, right? It takes a little bit of research, but you can find a place and a domain that you could probably use to send data to. We do have some future plans. Right now, it's not posted out there, but we are going to post Cookie Monster. Uh, we're going to put it in, in our uh, org in Professionally Evil. Uh, we want to have it do more than just OK. We want to actually have it return some data so it looks like people are browsing stuff. Uh, maybe return some new cookie values. Uh, we want to change the encoding so the number that says, hey, I'm part one of 16 is also encoded. Uh, and then you know, try and find a way to pick up a lost session, right? Now, once again, Cookie Monster may not be the best tool out there. There might be some better tools, but it was something that we came up with to try and get data on that side, this part of the test that's probably not done very often. Even if you don't have a pen tester or you don't do it for a company, hopefully you can encourage them to start testing, right, whatever they have, preventing data exfiltration. Everybody is focused on, you know, preventing people from getting in. We need to be sure the same focus is on can they get data out. And that's it, 10.30 on the nose. Any questions? Well, thank you for your time. Uh-oh. Uh The chunk, you're right, the, not the whole file. You can encode anything you want. 
but yes. Yes, sir. What are they using? Uh, that the gamut is huge. I, I wish I could give you one specific thing that says what they're using to manage their structured data. Uh, honestly, a lot of people are still having problems with that structured versus unstructured, right? Data management is a huge issue. Uh, it's amazing what you can find in open file shares still. Uh, yeah, it's amazing what's out there. So I wish I could give you one specific product, but I can't. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you for your time.